wonderful, wonderful nature. nature. <laughs> Welcome, Natasha. It's a huge pleasure to have you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, much, Christina. Christine. Thank you all. <laughs> First of all, thank Christina for your invitation and Concitec, who also the, <laughs> was a medium to, to provide uh, everything for my trip here. Thank you so much for coming. I will try to share with you our model of the work and technology transfer and also to um, show you our case study and our successful case story. So, um, let, Let me tell, me tell you this, this what the, um, um, Christina already uh, said. I will, uh, just in a couple of slides, I will tell you quickly what ICGB is. And then a little bit about Biotechnology Development Unit, that is my group. Just remind you quickly what are the biological, biopharmaceuticals, and biosimilars. I will tell you about our technology transfer model, our new pharma compliant laboratory at the ICGB that we just built during the COVID. And then a little bit more about uh, uh, latest um, uh, research that we do in the monoclonal antibody field and automation for high throughput clone selection. So ICGB, as Christina mentioned, is trying every year to promote <laughs> a very good international center. So we are the center organization for research, training, and technology transfer in life sciences to promote sustainable global development. We were open 1987 as United Nations Industrial Development Organization Special Project for developing countries and more correct term today is a low and middle income countries and uh, since 1995 we are independent international intergovernmental organization wow what does it mean it means that 68 countries around the world mostly low and middle income countries all those we have although we have the countries who are not anymore low and middle income countries but still, but still there are our member states. states. We are a big family with the three research components. Uh, the main one is in Trieste, where the, uh, in Italy, where the headquarter is based and my group. The other one is in India, New Delhi, and in the South Africa, Cape Town. We, what we do, we, uh, we do uh, research. So we have basically wet labs. We are not just some... Um, Although we are under UN United Nations umbrella, we are not just the labs who write documents, but we are really wet labs who do a very good science. We worked in the health and medical biotechnology field, sustainable and effective agriculture, industrial biotech and renewable energy, and across cutting priorities for us are gender and youth, South and South cooperation, least developed countries. I put all these nice uh, pictures from the United Nations Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Global Development. That means that we are working in a different fields, like we are trying to help zero hunger, good health, well-being, quality education, affordable and clean energy, industry innovation, infrastructure, and partnership for goals. And my group is actively doing last 30 years, more than 30 years in the good health and well-being as well. So that's the goal three of the United Nations agenda, but also in the number nine, that is industry, helping the infrastructure, local industry and the production. What are our instruments of action? How to do this? So it sounds very, very broad um, action plan. But how do we actually do? What are our instruments? So our first instrument is, of course, as we are all scientists, it's cutting edge science research in our labs. Then we offer different education support by long and short term fellowships for PhD and students and postdocs. We organize or help organizing, finance the, the organization of different meeting courses and workshops at the international level. We provide competitive grants for scientists in member countries, including collab CRP, collaboration research projects, early career research, uh, return grants, and so on. And last but not least is a technology transfer. So to industry for the production of bio bio biotherapeutics that my group do and diagnostics and we have a very good groups in the New Delhi who covered that field. And as well, we have a group in Italy who is doing technical assistance in the regulation of biotechnology and its products. So uh, shortly, it means that we have over 45 groups 
research groups in three centers working in the field, nine groups in infection disease, 70 group is non-communicable diseases, six in medical biotechnology, in seven in industrial biotechnology, and 10 in plant biology and biotechnology. Board of Governors, every year, uh, every country has their own representative and Christina is representative for Peru. And it pretty much looks like the, any United Nations meeting that every governor represents its country. And um, they decide about our action, about our um, uh, program, about our budget every year and guide us because we do need to do a science for the, to help our member states. Uh, last but not less important is that we are guided by the Council of Scientific Advisors and they are um, very important scientists from around the world. And I have to say that we always have one Nobel Prize laureate in, uh, in our council. Currently is uh, Richard Roberts from New England Biolabs from USC. Okay, so that was short what ICGB, but I'm sure I, I repeated just the things that Christina is repeating all over again. And uh, so I will tell you a little bit more about my technology development unit. So more than 30 years ago, so when in 80s, you know, my biotechnology was born, we were thinking, and 40 years ago when ICGB was born, we thought like biotechnology and genetic engineering should be for everyone, not just for a rich country. So the idea was born that let's try to work on the development of biotechnology and especially biopharmaceutical drugs, biological drugs, to develop our own expertise to produce this medicine in order to share this knowledge with our member states. So my group was opened in 1995 when launched in 1995 in the um, uh, basement. <laughs> and I like to tell this story because you will see where we are now. Uh, and it was windowless room, pretty much like trying to do, okay, growing the bacteria, like I heard today, one of the groups said, you know, put E. coli, try to produce micrograms of protein, use it and see what will happen. That was back in 1995, but then we really focused on the development of all the process, starting from genetically modified cells to the final recombinant protein. We started with interferon alpha, with the erythropoietins, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, um, insulin technologies, grow hormone. And um, then in 2018, we really make the big change and you will see what. So uh, we have our new, uh, we have a web website of ICGB, but the special, we have a special page for my group where it's really speaks industrial language. And while I'm telling you this, because I can see, and I've, I've been visiting uh, your beautiful country from uh, uh, Monday, going to Chachapoyas, visiting different uh, universities, um, Institute for Health, or private companies. And I can see that there are so many potential. And I will tell you why, because we learn how to how industry speak. And we, we, we learn how to speak different language, although we are scientists, and I more than 25 years I am in a constant and close contact with industrial partners. And that's why we launch our website that is really clear language for the industry. So just to give you an example that everything is important when you want to transfer your small research to the market. So, so uh, just, just a couple, couple of words, words of biologics. biologics. These are medicine produced from living organisms using genetic engineering, biotechnology te te techniques. They are really revolutionized the treatment of anemia, of cancers, diabetes, autoimmune disease in the last dec decades. And uh, um, I, I like to show this, that you know, before the biotechnology was born uh, to, uh, to produce insulin, and to treat diabetes, we had to extract it from the pancreas of pigs, and we had to use a 17 pigs for one patient's treatment for a year. And this looked like the butchery. It didn't look like biotechnology, you know, biotech industry. And you have to admit that today, this is much more elegant. So today we just put the recombinant E. coli bacteria yeast in the 250 bioreactor. It's a clean environment, control environment. 
and you can produce a much more of human insulin. So the first expression system introduced in the biotech industry was recombinant insulin in the 1978, and today most of the insulin is produced in the yeast and, and bacteria. They are one of the fastest growing segment uh, of the pharmaceutical industry. Global sales are billions of dollars. So I, I think I don't need to spend a lot of time to convince you that they're really important. They really change our lives. They, they, they give us uh, a, a new hope for patients, cancer patients and, 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 and other diseases. And there is a tremendous uh, a need for them, but however, they are unaffordable for the majority of the people on the earth because of the, their cost. So um, our mission at the Biotechnology Development Unit was like, okay, let's, let's develop, let's learn how to produce them. Let's strengthen capacity and competence of our local partners in 68 countries. And let's accelerate their product availability at the most affordable price. How to do it? Develop in-house expertise to produce them as a generic drug. So the generics of the biological drugs are called biosimilars. So you have to wait that patent expire, and then you are free to produce them as a generics. So once we learn how to develop that expertise, then we can transfer this know-how with no exclusivity. And this is really our model is a model of knowledge sharing. So it doesn't work anymore. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as I told you, biosimilars like the uh, similar version of the, so it contains the same active substance. So, if you talk about reference product insulin, it contains the same protein and it has, yeah, it's similar because, you, of course, the cell is uh, active, it's very alive. <laughs> and uh, so, the, the protein produced in a different cell can be different, they have, have different quality characteristics, biological activity, safety, and efficacy. So, when you produce by similar, you have to be as similar as possible to the original drug, and you have to show that they are safe and they have efficacy and activity as the originator drug. So the first generation of biosimilars, as the patent expired, were the, as I told you, interference, field gristin growth hormone, but then now the second generation of biosimilars are all kind of monoclonal antibodies. And this is exactly what we did and how we worked in our lab. We start the biosimilars today, they already came uh, to a came of age over the past 17 years. We had in European Union, um, uh, 84 approvals and in USA 35 approvals of the biosimilars. Uh, why they're important for our member states? Because they are 35 to 65 percent cheaper than the originator. And uh, as you can see, some examples on the EU5, it's like erythropoietin and GCS have really their price dropped even in the rich country. So that means a lot of saving on the health system. And as the price drop, there is a huge, much more doses and much more, num much bigger number of patients treated. Okay, so that's a good news. And uh, in the current wave, biosimilars have been limited to oncology, diabetes, inflammatory disease, but the next wave, we will see biosimilars that enter in the fields like neurology, respiratory disease, ophthalmology, and rare disease. So I hope I convinced you that this is really important. And, but also maybe now what your first thought is, oh yeah, but make a copy, it's like so easy. I can guarantee you that no pharma company will open their books and and they will show you the recipes. Every single product is uh, covered with um, more or less 200, more than 200 patents. And the patents usually is missing the most important part. <laughs> so you just, it doesn't mean I just open them. I do, you, you basically have to reinvent your process. You have to make your own cells, genetically modified cells. The good thing that you know the sequence in a drug bank, you can go and start at least with the known sequence, but then the same cell, even if you use the same mammalian cell, Chinese hamster ovarian cell, it will not be the same cell like was used 25 years ago, 20 years ago. 
Yeah, today we have different media for the cells, we have different bioreactors, we have much better techniques today, we can go faster and that will help us also to, um, to, to decrease the price of this new product. So you really have to spend time to develop all the processes. And to develop that, like we came to idea, we said, okay, if any original drug, you know, uh, has a little bit of uh, analytical study, so maybe most of you work or will work or worked in your life to, to find the new molecules and really had the dream to treat patients, you have to do a little bit of analytical studies because most of these drugs, new drugs, they don't know real mechanism. It doesn't matter, but they can, you can prepare a lot of preclinical and clinical data. And that means that you need a lot of money because clinical tri trials is the most expensive part. But when it comes to the, uh, the biosimilar, uh, if you want to develop it, you have to do a lot of analytics because you have to show that it's as similar, that is similar to the reference product. But then you have to be a little bit of preclinical and as, as little as possible clinical data. And now WHO is actually trying to uh, remove completely for some of these drugs, the biosimilars, the clinical data, because you really have to focus on this part. Why? Because then you can even save more. So we were thinking what every company who wants to start, you know, if they need to spend like seven to 10 years through all this process of the product development to the regulatory agency review and approval, that's a long time. And everyone have the same struggle at the beginning. So we thought, why don't we provide them a help in this to shorten this time and to develop it in house in the scale they like it, that this is like pre-pilot or pilot scale. And then we transfer them that knowledge very quickly and then they can basically every company have to start from here. So that means a lot of saving in time and money. And this is basically what we did. And this is what we are basically doing successfully for the last 30 years. We have using the three different systems, bacterial platform, E. coli, yeast, methylotrophic yeast, Pichia pastoris, and mammalian cell, Chinese hamster variant cell. We uh, close all the circles, starting with the cell and finish with the concentrated protein solution, doing all quality control tests as requested by authority. In Europe, it's called European Medicine Agency. They have a beautiful books that is like a Bible for a, a medicine. It's a European um, a pharmacopoeia product specific pharmacopoeia and they really nicely give you all kind of tests at least 10 12 tests that you have to do it to show that your protein is really good quality and compare it to the reference product so uh, these are all the molecules that we have developed in in house and then uh, I like to show this because most of you dreaming and working on your bench, you're working on this kind, small, small pre-packed columns, uh, you know, one milliliter, five milliliter, you are happy to obtain your milligram of protein. You think, oh, okay, yeah, I have a process. Yes, you have something that is good for research places. That's great. But if you want to transfer that to the industry, no one will be happy because they really, what they want, they want you to scale it up from these tiny four centimeter columns to at least, you know, one liter column that is at least pilot scale. So you can put six liter of the resin inside and purify grams of your protein. So we came with this idea, we will develop the process, but on the scale that time industry will be happy. So we really then can transfer that knowledge and that it has a value. And uh, for example, just to give you, this is yeast platform that we uh, we developed the uh, production of the insulin precursor, insulin Y, because maybe you saw so in the first slides that WHO really proclaimed that there is pandemic of diabetes. And the diabetes will be like around almost 400 billion people, uh, million people will be uh, infected by uh, diabetes. And most of increase is in the de uh, low uh, developing countries, you know, so there is a huge need for insulin. Insulin, um, uh, we produce it in the uh, yeast as an insulin precursor. And then for one molecule, we can finish with the three different products and uh, short lasting insulin or two uh, chemically modified insulins that are long lasting insulin is called Detemir and Degludec. Originator were developed by Novo Nordisk, Danish company. 
what we provide to the companies, you really have to be transparent and clean as much as possible to, to, to build this nice relationship with the industry. So the, with the industry, you never just write the, the sign the contract business, thank you very much, we deliver and that's it. Because we, in, the, in our member states, we saw it that the uh, small and middle companies that we usually work with, you, they really need uh, to establish relationship with us. So you have to uh, show them all the possible info information you have, be the transparent, try to you know build this trust. Uh, so we, we prepare all these protocols from fermentation, harvest, centrifugation, and then different kind of the, uh, purification, modification to arrive to the pure 98%, at least 98% pure of human insulin. And of course, it has to be very clear what is your dose and what is the cost of this, because of course, all of this is attractive if it's economically viable. If it's like, yeah, I know to use it. I, everyone knows how to produce one milligram per liter, but not everyone are capable to produce it three to five gram per liter. So that's the tiny difference. So that's where you, when you have something to offer to the industry, you always have to think, what is the problem that I will solve? And what is advantage that I have in comparison to the available solutions or to the other providers of the solution? So, um, okay, we do also chemical modifications. We have a very good organic chemistry lab and we learn how to do, uh, prepare all these linkers that are used to prolong the life of the drug. So this is a long lasting uh, step. And just to show you how, when people come to me and said, oh, that's easy. Oh, just to tell you that all these steps, just in the chemical modifications, we had to, uh, um, invent, uh, we have to be very creative to perform that and optimize every single step, and it takes time. When it comes to quality control, as I told you, there is a complete list of these quality control tests, and this is what we perform. This is, for example, for erythropoietin, our produced in the lab and standard. We always compare and do all kinds of the tests to show the physical chemical property, biological activity, to show all the impurity in the final product to do in vitro test and in vivo test because we have also animal house. So the idea was that we develop everything that you can be completely independent. So when the company comes to us, Nika said, yes, you don't need to rely on the rich company from the Netherlands, from United States, send them a sample, wait for one month or whatever. We will teach you to perform everything in-house. How do we do that? Okay, okay, just so, so through, through the technology, technology transfer. transfer. So, so I, know I know that everyone heard about technology transfer, but I think it's always good to, first of all, you know, whenever I talk to people, I always like to, to know that we are talking about the same thing. So I would like to say, can, can, we, can we define it? So we know that we are talking about technology transfer. So this is a transfer of know-how, knowledge, capability, experience, and documentation of product, process, and methodology. Why I'm saying this between the developer and producer? Because I, I often hear people say, I don't have a product to offer, but it doesn't need to be a product. It can be methodology. It can be a process. I heard this morning, people saying what do they, they develop. I heard all these <laughs> days and, and I'm saying, yeah, but you can transfer knowledge. You can transfer a technique. You can transfer anything you learn. It's, it's possible to transfer. It doesn't need to be the whole package. So... Technology transfer was really identified as a mean to enable local pharmaceutical production, promote innovation, uh, by building capacity, improving medicine access, it's not me, it's WHO documents, and decrease, what is more important, is decrease reliance on imports, raise quality and competence of the local workforce. So this is something that is may, maybe also, it was neglected, uh, you know, in the past decades that we really need a, um, people trained. We need a workforce. You know, it's it's not just yes. I know to do it in my own lab and my three uh, my three fellow and uh, you know. But how you will really think and and build capacity in one country? It's like really how you will train people. 
So, so I'm telling you because one of the parts at the end will be how we approach WHO and how we got sponsors from a WHO with one of our trainings because WHO more than a year ago, uh, they uh, announced that there is a huge need for uh, bioprocess uh, process engineers, uh, you know, workforce in a biotech field because they saw with the COVID, yes, we develop vaccines and we can transfer anywhere in the, in, in the globe. But, but when, when we come, come to the least and uh, developed, developed countries, countries, there are really no people to train. So, so then, then you realize, realize like they realize in a Senegal Pasteur Institute, great, we want to be, be a part of the vaccine uh, hub, but we need to train at least 200 people next year. So who will who will train 200 people? So then we came up with a, a solution and then they they, they uh, annou announced the call for the bio uh, processing training hub and the last year uh, south korea was uh, announced like the central hub for training uh, and we are part of that network and i will show you later how so we all now agree that technology transfer is the key of social economical development Okay, okay, so, so we, we provide, provide what? what? This, we call it a technology in the briefcase because we signed the contract, uh, fi finalized technology transfer agreement. We train people in our own labs from between four and six weeks. Uh, people from the companies, they usually send three persons, three to four persons, because they really have to work. It's not theoretical, it's practical course. And then uh, when they do one or two batches of production purification and quality control, we give them in the briefcase all the protocols, strains and everything. They can go home and they can reproduce all the process. And then we can assist them to reproduce the process, but then they're completely free to develop their own business models. Okay, okay, so, so we, we did more more than 25 years of experience in this field. We signed more than 70 agreements with the companies uh, from 22 different countries. We trained more than 100 uh, scientists in our own lab. In blue are the countries where we train people. Uh, and in the green are countries that succeeded with some of these technologies reach the market. We are not following them. We are not following their business plans. We are not following the line, you know, when I show you the, how to arrive to the market, because we want to share knowledge. We want to train people, and then they decide what, what they want to do with that. Okay, so then after all of these things, we uh, we said, okay, we were working more or less like you have research labs. There are beautiful research labs there. They, uh, they are a good environment to work in, but if you want to train people from the industry, you really need something far more compliant, something that is more similar to their future environment. So we ask a local region uh, where uh, Trieste is based, is a Friuli Venezia Giulia. We approach them and ask uh, 3 million euros to try to build the new labs. So uh, not to be anymore. So we move from the basement during the years into the normal research labs like you are used to see. But then uh, with this, uh, we got 3 million euros and this is what we propose. And we actually propose this plan in 215 square meters. We built the, in yellow, are the classified rooms. This is the lowest class, this is class D. So we are, we are talking about a GMP rules, good manufacturing practice. And uh, this yeah, in yellow are the microbial facility, uh, downstream lab for purification, and central quality control lab. But then you enter again, you have to dress here and you are entering the class C orange area where is mammalian cell line facility because then we were ready to start to develop in technology for the uh, monoclonal antibodies production, not production, like training, you know. Because, because we will we never be production facility, but we are. Uh, we have a much clean. We have a clean rooms for training and development, and this is how the facility look after all the instruments that we'll do. And I have to say, this is uh, how the clean rooms look like before the instruments, and then when we put the instruments. These are all the instruments in quality control lab, but I, I think that you will more, more enjoy in this three minute video that I prepared how this dream came true. So how our dream to move from the basement to the clean environment looks like. And I have to say, this was a really hard, tough, uh, tough uh, uh, job because we did it during the COVID and we did it in incredible 11 months. So enjoy. Just want to show 
So, so, so now we have, we have much better, better conditions to work in. in. So, so it was really a pleasure to enter in this control environment. environment. And um, we invested, um, so, so we, we continue now, now uh, since we, we entered there, there, we start working, working on the monoclonal antibodies uh, production. Uh, so, so why monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies? antibodies? Because these, these are antibodies, antibodies made by identical immune cells, cells that are all clones of unique parental cells. cells. They're very complex molecules. And this is why we had to prepare the uh, environment all these years to start working on the monoclonal antibodies to develop the expertise because they are very complex molecule with all possible post-translational modifications. And you can imagine that if you have to be uh, similar, similar to the reference product, product you really need to adjust many things, you know, glycosylation, uh, yeah, all, all kinds of modifications of amino acids, acids and so on. on. So, so um, there, are there are different formats today of monoclonal antibodies or their fragments, and there are many antibodies uh, 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 register on the market as therapeutics. Uh, FDA approved 100 monoclonal antibody products. They are mainly in the research area as a cancer, but there are also different uh, areas. And these are all the list of the monoclonal antibodies and when the date of their patent expire in the US. And we had to choose which one we will use, you know. So, and then we start to think and we chose one that is a patent expired 2019. That is a trastuzumab. This is a monoclonal antibodies to treat the breast cancer. Originator drug is called Herceptin from Roche. And we knew it that if you want to do it in mammalian cell, you need to have gram per liter production. And this is really challenging. If you want to make a stable clone of mammalian cell, anyone can do it in milligram per liter. But you know, to have a gram per liter, it means that you have to choose the cell that is a really very rare in the population. So when you do electroporation, transfection of the cell, you have to choose, you have to pick up 0.3% of the high producers. If you do it in the old fashioned way, you do it um, serial dilution, you know, half cell in the 96 well plate, it will be a lot of screening, you will spend months and traditional took eight months to find a good producer. Today, we are talking about weeks. 
So this is what industry do today. So that's why we invest the money in this instrument that is the only one in Italy. And this is what I, when I told you, what is the problem and what is your solution? So the problem was how to find a good producer and everyone in the pharma companies around the world have the same problem. And then we found the solution that no one else has it in Italy. So then we said that will give us advantage that to approach pharma companies in Italy and find the financing, but also it gives us advantage to approach the producer of this machine that is American producer. And then if they wanted to go and expand their activities in Italy, we also signed with them co-marketing agreement. That means we can be at your training lab and you can cover our service for free. So this is the other thing. When you think to buy a very expensive instrument, you have to think in advance how the hell you are going to maintain this instrument if you are self-sustained lab like my lab is. So, so you think, have, have to think in for the solution uh, 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 from the beginning. So having a co-marketing agreements give us a free service and give us 30% discount on all the consumables that we use. And for return, we made a podcast with them. And whenever there is some client, we can show, we have be a showroom and show them. But then also that give us not just advantage, that give us advantage also to know who are the future clients, how we can collaborate with them. And also that we can offer this to our member states. Because of course, I will not be, uh, choose the sales and select the cell every day. But if I want to have switch on instrument, I, I saw many instruments around the world switched off. And this is a main problem that the scientists, most of the instruments in the labs are most of the time during their day just switched off. So idea was, uh, uh, this is, I'm telling you all this because maybe you will some click in your everyday life, like, oh, we have the same situation. Maybe I could do the same thing. So what this machine do, this is the uh, clone picker. So it's a basic robot that is doing, uh, uh, we grow the cells, uh, electroporate the cell, the cells that are producers of monoclonal antibodies, we grow them in a semi-solid media. In the semi-solid media, we put the fluorescent label antibody against the antibody. And as the cell secrete antibody, it um, accumulates around the cell and it's bind to the fluorescent anti uh, antibody. And then you can nicely visualize them and you can see that among the thousands of cells that are white or greenish, you can find like one, two or three that have a bigger hollow around the cell and these are a potential a good uh, uh, producer. So this basically robot, we tell them what to do and he can pick 10,000 cells in a day. So what usually you would do a month, it can be now do in days. So this is what we had to prepare our own platform, how to develop monoclonal antibodies. And this can be translated, we do it with the trastuzuma, but that could be done with any molecule and any innovative molecule. So tomorrow, whoever comes with the group leaders and we have collaboration research projects, we can go it, we can uh, run it through our platform. So, so we, have we have electroporation, we have the, 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 the selection of the cells growing in the semi-solid media, one day picking, and then going through the couple of days growing in the 96 well plate. We can then monitor in ELISA test. And it's beautiful that we have together with this clone pick, we, uh, pick machine, we have also imager. So in every single 96, every single clone, you can see the growth curve. You can see everyday confluence. So you can choose not just the good producer, but you can see also how they grow, are they stable and so on. And then you can amplify them to prefer cell banking and go to the then to flask level and in the bioreactor. We have bought the single use bioreactors amber 250 milliliter. With the one control unit, we can control four or eight bioreactors. We didn't have enough money, so we bought four, but there is space to grow and we'll have more money. And then from 250, when you optimize the process, you can go to two, two liter bioreactor that we have in the lab. Yeah, trastuzumab, uh, I, I told you, uh, um, well, a main reason why we choose it is because this is the most breast cancer is the most common cancer for women in both developing and developed countries, and it's a leading cause of cancer death for, for women. 17 to 30% is a HER2 positive, and the trastuzumab is humanized anti HER2 antibody. And um, uh, what was nice, then when we decided to use it, WHO actually pre qualified the first biosimilar medicine trastuzumab from Samsung called Ontruzan. And that was a really move that would make a life changing treatment more affordable and available. And that gave us a confirmation that we chosen the right molecule to work with. 
And uh, so what we had to do, we had to do all the trials with different promoters, terminators, signal peptides, codon optimization to arrive to the light and heavy chain and in the reducing SDS page in the right uh, proportion. And uh, uh, then when we had uh, the expression plasmid, then we had to work on the cells. Chinese hamster ovarian cells are the same cells that originated Rush used. So we had to use the same cell. You can't use the HEC or if you want to be similar, so you have to use CHO, but um, we didn't want to use antibiotics, so we, we decided to use a CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing tool to uh, um, kill the glutamine synthesized gene, uh, so the cells cannot grow in the media without glutamine, so that means that glutamine synthesized genes we could use as a selection marker on the expression vector, and we successfully did, did it, and I'm telling you this because then we learned how to do CRISPR-Cas9 and how to optimize it and how to work with these cells and with this beautiful genetic editing tool. And then it came up the idea, okay, so now we know how to do it and we can offer these people as a training. So now we are just about to sign the contract with one very big Brazilian company who do development of their own biosimilars, but they don't know still how to use CRISPR-Cas9. So I'm telling you this because that any knowledge that you have now, if the right moment is, and for Cas9 now is the right moment to train, not anymore, maybe polymerases or whatever, that many people can do and that is what give you the, the advantage so they're really happy to come to our lab for a two weeks training to see how to do and to bring their own cells because they, we give them these possibilities and as the cells before you come here we teach you how to do it and then you can go home and then if you want to do picking and use our machine clone picker, you can come back and spend maybe one month with us and do it. So that is like the machine that is going on because I heard today like, oh yeah, we like basic science. I love basic science. I mean, I mean, I'm trained as a basic scientist. But in order to have the constant um, uh, financing, we develop the machine and knowledge sharing of every single step that will then feed and maintain our lab while we do basic science as well. Okay, so uh, cell engineering, picking the cell, growth curve of every single clone, and we arrived to the first uh, experiment, the fat batch flask level to 0.6 gram per liter, but when we put it in the bioreactor, we arrived to 1.2 gram per liter, so we were quite confident that we have industrial acceptable process, and then we had to run through the, all the tests for quality control, and they actually look like this, and of course, the most challenging was the glycogen glycan profiling. Uh, gly glycan profiling was um, something that we are still working on, adjusting the glycosylation. So it's not just important the quantity, but of course, the quality of the protein. And uh, hopefully until the end of this year, we will be ready and scale up to the two liter scale to be to offer. So then with the trastuzumab, you know, if we show that, then, then you know, we, we now know what would be the next one and how to, to feed the, the budget of our, our lab. Uh, so this is my team. And I always like to say that, you know, that the showing the team should be probably the first slide in every presentation because without them, of course, this wouldn't be uh, possible. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Any questions? I mean, I didn't show you because we don't have enough time. I had a, a, another presentation with many different activities that we do at the ICGB. And we developed, of course, um, uh, different support for member states when it comes to the lamp detection during the COVID. And now we are applying to the different infectious disease like Zika. Uh, we, we, we build a whole network for Africa. Then we have a laboratory who is doing synthetic biology, offering this freedom to operate the plasmids, enzymes, and so on, and having the, and this will be an, our new group leader coming from Cambridge in September this year. We have different projects when it comes to um, production of the research tools. So in my lab, we are producing also Cas9 because then we came up with the idea, of, that's great, I can train someone from the Zimbabwe, but probably if they want to buy Cas9, it will take them a lot of time to have Cas9, but also a lot of money. 
So then we developed E. coli small production of the Cas9. So, and then we offered that as a training, whoever wants in their own lab produce a Cas9, we can do that. And then uh, for WHO, maybe I can show you, there is another, if you have five minutes uh, uh, patient, <laughs> Yeah, I, I need just my second presentation. Let me see if I will succeed uh, to do it. I have to find my presentation. Uh, 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 let me see. I would need my presentation, the second one. Can I just see smaller number here to choose the slide? Okay, let me just choose which one. Okay, so uh, when we build this lab, um, uh, of course, we, we suffer a lot because we didn't know how to make it. And then we called engineers and engineers came and say, okay, what do you want? So how do you know what I want? I thought that the engineer will know what they do. So we really, I, it was a year process to make a very good plan how to optimize and uh, build these laboratories and also to build all the system of quality control. So the good manufacturing practice, it's something that covers everything. It covers uh, the, let me go before, uh, it can't move, okay. Um, no, let's try like this. No. Okay. okay, so, so a good manufacturing, a manufacturing practice, practice covers this quality, quality that, that it is the part of quality assurance, which ensures ensure that the products, products are constantly produced, controlled with the same standards, but it, it, it covers all these kind of, of things like how to, what is the hygiene in, in your uh, facility, quality management, traceability, and so on. And we had to, in a, uh, in a year time, we had to develop all the documents. So that was a help. So we had a person, we, we took the person who became a quality um, um, uh, qualified person for us. But then I thought, oh my God, now we have this and we are not production facility and I have no problem with sharing knowledge. So then we proposed that we have a two weeks trainings that can uh, include all these quality management system so that means that i will we will train every morning people for uh, two weeks uh, how we design this facility what are the main gmp guidelines what is the quality control assurance cleaning doc and then the most important documentation overview so we can open our documents and the people who are planning to build this kind of facility they can come and they can have samples because this costs a lot <laughs> you know, because you have to build this system and it's thousands and thousands of documents. And then we thought, okay, we don't want to be just because our advantage is a hands-on training. Then in the afternoon, we will pick up one of our processes like Phil Grastein called on GCSF. Then we would go through the upstream, downstream processing and quality control tests from 11 to 5. They can be actually trained in the lab. And, and we, we expect, expect like, like this, this to help more people. So, so not, not just, just people from the company, company you know, for product-based product -based transfer, transfer, but we can, we can uh, you know, promote this best practice, practice to uh, much, much more, more people, people in the country who can then further on train others. others. And, and that's that what we proposed to WHO and they accepted. And in December last year, they sponsored us and they sent us the first 10 trainees from uh, four different countries around the world. And uh, we had our consultants as well who came and we give the, the lecturers we simulated the audit in the GMP in the morning but then in the afternoon they had to enter in the labs and they really had to run the process uh, in the 30 liter bioreactor purified in these big columns chromatography columns and uh, do perform all the quality control tests and they were really happy uh, so um, after that we tested this system and it worked well and then we decided to offer these two weeks training to our member states and the first member state that responded was the government of Zimbabwe 
and their national biotechnology authority send us people and we a couple of uh, months ago we trained them in this so this is another example like if you thought that you don't have anything <laughs> you can always prepare a package of of your expertise and you can offer it as a training to the less developed universities, less developed uh, countries, you know, and there is always need for something maybe what, what is your advantage. And of course, to that, we saw that every that um, um, there is a huge need for, uh, for example, herbal medicine training. We are not experts in herbal medicine. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying that the African Union for uh, clinical, clinical trials came to us and they said, yes, we, we know how to produce extract from the plants and everything. We have collaborators to demonstrate the mechanism of action and everything, but when we will come to the production, we really don't know how to deal with it. And then we said, okay, uh, WHO issued different technical reports when it comes to the good manufacturing practice of the herbal medicine. And um, the core requirements for GMP for herbal medicine are common to GMP for pharmaceutical products. That's then we said, that's great because then means that my qualified person with consultants, they can start to prepare the packages of this. And we are actually now performing the, um, the package for them and to do, to, first, to do first online training for this uh, African Union. Uh, sponsored, of course, that means more financing for my lab. <laughs> that means more help for them and um, yeah, yeah, this is another this is example, example how we really uh, 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 transfer, transfer every, every single knowledge that we created in the lab into the product process training. <laughs> really very, very nice, uh, very interesting talk. And I, I would like to know if, uh, if how to, uh, do we, do we apply to these training programs? Does the country has to request for it or can a, a group of uh, researchers do it or this uh, individual? Uh, uh, how does it, uh, does it work? Because here at Cayetano, there are several groups that are working on the production of uh, recombinant proteins, etc. And uh, we usually are working quite well, well, after all, all the, the challenges, challenges uh, that each of us uh, have, uh, but we are doing it at the research lab and we're trying to go into the pilot scale and then scale it up more. And that we don't know. Most of us, I'm sure, we don't know anything about. And that those training programs sound beautiful. Thank you very much for your question. So, um, of course, my, my lab is very small, and when we have this kind of trainings, it goes usually through the technology transfer office. So, the, whoever is interested, contact me or directly technology transfer office, and then we discuss about or the product or the type of training, and then we tailor to the... Yeah, to the guest. Uh, when we do two weeks trainings, we always said we need at least um, uh, between five and 10 people because my five people are training. So I need to have at least a little bit more trainees than trainers. <laughs> and uh, um, so, yeah, we, we have this kind of different programs, but it goes through our board contacting directly me and we see what is the need. And there are different type of uh, uh, activities. So when we have the standard technology transfer, it's really like for the company and who is in interested in the product. So it needs to be a critical mass and, you know, because I have to stop at least three months work of my lab, completely lab to prepare the lab for the transfer, to train them and post, uh, you know, clean everything by the, all the standards and so on. When it comes to something that you mentioned that is maybe, yeah, we would like to know how to do a scale up. I guess that you want to scale up your own product. So it means that this is some kind of the research collaboration because every protein is its own story. And for development of every process, we spend years. So it means that you can be trained you know how to use the fermenter of 30 liter, what does it mean, this kind of chromatography, but basically, you know, as a researcher, you have to invent and develop process for your protein, you know, so that could be more like research collaboration that again, it goes like 
you know, we talk, we see what, what, what you mean, and then we go to uh, talk to the technology transfer office and see how to do this kind of collaboration. For a two weeks training, why I proposed this training? Because I saw so many requests from the, all around the world because people said we are not company and I really cannot do this and I cannot come for a longer time and so on. So we said maybe this kind of two weeks training can cover broad range, everything, all the production process. We can train more people. We can train maximum, like say 10 people, 10 to 12, because otherwise it's not effective training. And that could be covered by or the government or the university or whoever comes, uh, you know, but it has to be critical mass of the people who will then be trained to that. But then you have to realize that won't be your product, but that will be one of our example products and one of our processes that we already know to run. But just to give you that there is a value in that because when we will run all the quality control tests you know through the peptide mapping capillary electrophoresis following monograph teaching people what does it mean to uh, you know uh, run this method and how to really think about um, uh, results and uh, interpret results and everything you can apply it to anything and also you can think that this process maybe after the training you can reproduce in your own lab, you can see how it works, you can apply the same knowledge, you know. And I also, uh, Christina knows, I, I, I tell this story because when we train even the uh, companies, you know, sometimes companies in developing uh, countries, they are not really ready to go with that market because there are no regulation in the country, because they don't have enough money there. But then, then they, they become, become their own biotechnology development unit. Then, then they, they become, become a training a center, center or, or then they, they change, change the idea. idea. Like, like I, I, I told the story, story that is nice story. When I was last year in Uruguay, then I, uh, uh, after my uh, presentation, the lady came to me and said, look, Natasha, you probably don't remember me, but 11 years ago, your team trained me and my, my, my um, other two colleagues. And we were like, uh, from the university wanted to propose the, the government to, to produce one of these products. And then when we came back, we realized that there are no regulations, that Uruguay is so small that, you know, producing, investing in everything, it was impossible. But then, you know what, we took all that knowledge and we opened the first startup at the university to produce vaccine for veterinary use. Because they said, we learn how to use this. So we run all the process and we just came up with the idea. Now we are established producer of the vaccines for veterinary use. Just to tell you that it's not just that product and it's not a failure if you don't arrive to the market with that product, but that knowledge that we share, you can use it in many different ways. <laughs> no more questions? Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. Of course, and the other story was with a company in Bangladesh that we worked with, and they're very established pharma company, and they never saw live cells, and they never, you know, they thought, oh my God, yeah, that's, you know, that's not for us. We trained their team, and they came back to home, go, go, went home, and they knew that they want to put the first biosimilar on the market, but they realized there are no regulations in the country. But then that was great, because then they were big enough that they went to the government and they said, we want to establish regulations and they succeeded. So now there are regulations and there is a first biosimilar in Bangladesh. I'm not saying that all the credit does to us. I just know that we helped them in the first step. Maybe during the, the path, they changed the cells. Maybe they do completely different redesign process, but we were at least a primer in that stage. And also they were brave enough to challenge the governments and to change, you know, and to put the regulations in place. Is your lab available for that? Yes, yes, yes. two weeks training. No, 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 no. Like the Arturo Falaski, the fellowships.
Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Do you want to explain a bit about that? Maybe you know better than me about fellowships. I mean, at the beginning, we saw there are different uh, kind of fellowships that ICGB offer. Of course, it's competitive because we have 68 countries. I'm not I'm not part of the NA selection committee. That's independent body. But uh, uh, they offer also different kind of the short-term uh, uh, fellowships, and it's usually to do some kind of work that you can't do here. So, for example, the, when you ask me, okay, I would like to see to to, to see the scale up. So, if that fellowship cover that fellowship usually covers three months, person to come to our own lab and then to perform the the, the work that we agree. So, so if it's if your, your protein, protein, maybe we can run through three months through the process. You have to work on your own, of course, because we need hands there, but you can be trained in some part of these processes and we help you to, to move forward your research. Which kind of fellowships are available? That is on our website and maybe you know. Yes, yeah, maybe you can take a little, you know, a little cherry because <laughs> that's, that's what I'm supposed, supposed to do as the governor. governor. But, but I'm, I'm always, always telling, telling you know, you know there's, there's some fixed some dates into which, which people, people from, from the countries, from the member countries, can apply for a short stage in the ICGB components like New Delhi, Cape Town, or Trieste, with a leader of their choice. You saw this 46 groups. And I keep telling you the dates. It's 30th of March and 30th of September. You have to be at postgraduate level. It is extremely competitive. But, but you can, you also, can also ask for a short-term short fellowship, fellowship uh, in any of the member countries. countries. Like, like you want, want to, go to go to this, to I don't know, whatever, microscope, microscope in Brazil, Brazil you, you ask for it, it, you get it. The short-term short south-south, you, you, you get it. But anyway, stop stopping with, with, with the cherries. cherries. I don't know if there's any more questions about why Natasha is here. I think that's Of course, now, the, your customers, your customers look, look for you, you. At, at any, any point, point at the beginning, I guess, you look for them. them. Do you have, you have uh, a body of people with that, that task of uh, looking, looking for those and, uh, companies, companies that, that need, need your services? services. How, do How do you get, get your first, first customers? customers? Okay, that, that was before I came, <laughs> I have to say, and that was a brilliant idea of our first, uh, second director general, that was Professor Baralev, he's Argentinian, because they were uh, a lot of work in Argentina starting on, uh, on biotechnology, so the first contacts were always through the uh, word of mouth because promoting ICGB around, we found a couple of them that they really were interested. Our first clients were from Iran, from, from Argentina. So, and we offered them, and of course we didn't have all this structure. We had it just more, but we offered them, okay, we can be like your extended research lab. So why not thinking out the box? You don't need to have all the research lab in your own small company, but you can use us. So we started like developing process together, you know, before doing actual technology transfer. And then once we established that first contact, then it was really relationship going on for years and decades. And I have to say that most of those people, I mean, we never, I mean, website, let's talk honestly, website is not used as my promotion at all because it's not Google optimized. I'm not investing any money. And if you write, you will not find me, you will find me on the 10th page. And after two clicks, everyone loses a patient. But I use my website as my business card. So if you need more information, please click there and that's it. So I have to say that um, we are not searching. I, I'm, I'm promoting now and going around to see our member states. And then and, and whenever I go, I ask, can I see some of the local companies? And now it's easier because people know for us. But we started through the development let's, let's develop, develop together let's, let's see what, what we can do and now it's of course i i have to say it's much easier but we are going to the country and i'm just trying to see where are the needs so for example in italy we didn't have any contact in italy because we are focused on the other member states you know and we really don't think that one of those technologies can compete any player in europe 
you know, we are not even pretending that we want to compete uh, with the United States, uh, European, and so on. But now when we, I have these new tools, I have these new toys in the lab, I was just going, you know, Menarini, Menarini is the one of the big, uh, biggest pharma companies in Italy, knock, knock, I know their director, why don't we chat and, and really promoting, going around. Now it works like this, yeah. And now I have to say that there are most of them they're returning. So whoever was trained once, then it are for sure will come to be trained at least for new technologies. And now they know that we will develop something new and they ask, okay, what's next? And now I also the change the tactic. I'm now going there and I ask, what would you like us to be next? So they're like now 20 monoclonal antibodies, the patent will expire, which one to use? For me, one is the same as the other because I have a platform. And now I was doing last year, the Latin American tour. And then I asked every single company said, if you can, what is your wish? <laughs> give me your wish list and then more or less they will agree what could be the next molecule so now i have an idea and also our model is like this we are not cro we are not contract research organization i'm not working like you said i can collaborate with you to develop your product but then it's your product I'm, i will not promote your product i will not sell that product or keep that technology but with this model we invest our own money into new product that I can then transfer whoever I want and how much time I want with no exclusivity. And this is the difference in our model. Because, you know, when company comes to you and says, develop me this, and you spend three years in developing, great, they cover your research for three years, but then they are gone and you have nothing. Except, of course, I mean, experience. <laughs> Yeah, so, so you have, have to, decide to decide from the beginning what, what will be really your model and how you will approach them. But believe me, now companies, they really love to talk to scientists. I mean, if you, I, I saw many scientists saying, I don't know how to tell, but they love it. I mean, they love, they, they love to hear new ideas, especially if it's a good one. <laughs> Fantastic. Is there anything else? I mean... Well, you push your cells to produce so, so much, much antibody, antibody that glycosylation, glycosylation doesn't change? change. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, so, so you, you, you get, get partial, partial products, products with no, no glycosylation, glycosylation or... I mean, the glycosylation is so complex. I mean, we have in this monoclonal, and the fucosylation, galactosylation, sialidation, we have everything. Uh, so uh, for me, it's easier when it's biosimilar, I have to stay in the certain range. So I know I have to be between between 3 and 5% fucosylation, 11 for trastuzumab, you know, because there are some monographs that uh, FDA is preparing for this small, uh, molecule. But even if it's not available, you take like a, 10 lots of the originator drug, you run it through the glycan profiling, and then you make your own range, acceptable, like the range that is more or less, that will give you the same activity. And then you try to adjust it. So of course, when you push more production, then you will struggle in some glycosylation uh, uh, pathway, but then uh, we know where to work. So we were working first with the galactosylation through the, uh, everything is done through the um, medium additives. So this is what you usually do. Yes, and now we are like, we have to adjust, we arrived to the, we have to adjust 2% focusylation. So we have now uh, have to kill the gene. So we are now first using the, some chemical inhibitors that can also inhibit the growth. But then if nothing works, then we will use CRISPR-Cas9 to kill the gene. So um, yeah, that's the most challenging part really. <laughs> 